never, ever, ever quit was the Winston Churchill quote. And quitting's got a bad name. But you've been trying to launch this business for a year. You've been promoting, you've been selling, you've sold a couple, you've been running some mini experiments. You've been working on your business for some time and it ain't performing. But the question is, will it ever perform? Should you quit? Should you try something else? Where do you go from here? Welcome to the Rebel Entrepreneur. What would it take to become the hero of your own life? To build the business you've always dreamt of? To make money doing something you love? It's time to take control. Can we get on with making money and having fun now? I'm not doing it if it's not fun. Join the rebellion with Alan Donegan and welcome to Rebel Entrepreneur. Welcome to the Rebel Entrepreneur and I am lucky to have with me today my business partner Simon Payne from the Pop-Up Business School. Welcome to the show Simon. Thank you Alan. Yes you are lucky. You're very lucky indeed because I feel this topic is the sort of topic that gets me fired up. So I'm looking forward to diving into this with you. Quitting. Quitting gets you fired up. <laughs> yes, it does. The thought of quitting gets me fired up. And that's why I don't ever, <laughs> ever, ever quit. Ever. Well, I think it's this thing that we quite regularly get people who come to us and say, we've launched the business, we've done this, I've tried everything and it's not worked. What should I do? I've actually been through this personally. I know you have. Lots of business ideas don't work, but some do. And how do you know if you're quitting just before you get to the huge launch, to the big success, to the big customer? And, you know, how many years do you give it? Is there rules? When do you quit? What are your thoughts on quitting, Simon? Have you quit before? I think it's more about pausing and pivoting and doing something different. And I've, what I've noticed is that I go around a cycle of, you know, a whole bunch of ideas that I have lots of energy and enthusiasm for. And then it burns out like phosphorus when I don't get the results that I want. So I move on to the next thing and the next thing. And then I go, ah, I've got some success here. I'm going to dive into this one and really, really lean into it. So Gillian Johnsford, that was the thing that I chatted to her about was, is it time to lean in to pop up? And is it time to put these other projects to one side and go, yeah, this is the one that you're furthest along on. So lean in and deliver this thing because you're going to have to do it with one of them. You're going to have to fully commit if you want any one of your business ideas to roll and to really be successful, which one are you going to choose to lean in on and not let go of this? So I think the word that you said a few seconds ago when you were talking about this was that when we meet people and they say, look, I've tried everything and it's just not working. I want to dive into what do they mean by the word everything? Because I've heard that so many times. Like I've tried everything. I've tried everything and it's just not working. And I go, so what do you actually mean by the word everything? Yeah. What Talk is everything? That. Tell me about everything. Yes. Because you know, you know my riff on this, Alan, which is you don't have the right to say it's not working yet because I'm going to give you a whole bunch of things to consider before you can say, you know what, I think it is time you know, to quit. And I think these things happen way, way before I'll even ask the question, does the market actually want this? You know, is there a space for this? Is your marketing going to work? You know, before I even get to any of that stuff, there's a whole bunch of things that go through my mind that says you don't have the right to say it's time to quit unless you've considered these points, if that makes sense. It does, absolutely. Like, how can you know if it's going to work or not unless you've given it a proper shot? And I think it's the proper shot bit. It's the you've actually poured some fuel on the fire, you've thrown your energy into it, you've really worked hard to see whether this would work. And then you can go, okay, I've given it my best shot and let's look at the results and decide whether to go in further or or move on to the next thing to quit so what do you think is in that list simon if we were to give the listeners of the rebel entrepreneur that list so you've done your mini experiment which simon and i were speaking on episode seven about mini experiments you've run your mini experiment this is what you've done now you've got the right to quit and move on or pivot and move on if you want to. What is that list you have to have tried? 
I'm not going to tell you because this is my best stuff. This is the juice. I'm just going to keep it to myself. This is going to be a very short episode, Alan. Or maybe I'll tell you a couple of them. <laughs> now, of course, I want to tell you every single one because I know that as I start talking, it's going to create new ideas in your head too. But I think if you were to attribute one thing that you've done that's perhaps different to lots of folk, and when we first met in 2008, you were smack bang in the middle of this journey. You know, I know that you would say that you've invested in your own learning and you've invested in your personal development has been the, like, probably the number one game changer. Would that be right? Would you say that's the thing that's had the biggest impact on you? Well, it depends, I guess, which side you're looking. What's had the biggest impact on the success of my business? What's had the biggest impact on my life? My mind went two places. One is definitely self-development. Number two is I did what people found scary and I did marketing. I sent emails, I did calls and I proactively went out and sold. And I think those would be the two different bits, but I wouldn't have done the proactive sales if I hadn't done the self-development to build my confidence, my energy, to know what questions to ask, to develop my character and personality to a point that it attracts customers. So I think, yeah, self-development is the number one. The number two is, which I see all the time, people want to quit because they're scared of doing the sales. They haven't actually tried it. That's the bit for me, and it's about the fear. And I think getting yourself to a place where you can go out, make phone calls, send emails, you know, make better phone calls, send better emails, do better marketing, you're learning by doing, and you're doing it in a very practical way. But there's also a bit to this, which is you're accelerating your learning by putting yourself out there and making it happen and getting out of your comfort zone. But there's also a bit here of, you know, investing in your own education. So I see lots of people that come to our courses that are frustrated because they go, I don't know how to use Instagram or I don't know how to get a YouTube channel rolling. And they come to pop up, but they sometimes they'll leave pop up with the same questions. And I would say to them, the reason why you're not making progress with your business is that you haven't continued your learning journey. You know, that's definitely in one of my lists that if there's three things that you need to do to accelerate your capability with your business. And I think you often talk about uh, all of the things to learn, learn how to sell. And I kind of add to that and go learn how to promote and sell. The three things on my list will be learn new things, learn new things, and learn new things by getting out of your comfort zone. And I think lots of people stagnate with their learning journey. And if you've got two people, one of you know, same business idea, but one of those entrepreneurs is spending more time in learning the very practical skills. And there's lots of different ways to learn. Of course, you know, you can learn by doing, you can go and find someone who's an expert, make friends with them. You know, you could jump onto some courses. You could copy what people are doing. You know, I get often get asked the question, I don't know what hashtags to use on my posts. And I said, well, who are the top five people that are in your space? What hashtags do they use? And nobody knows the answer to that. You know, that thing of success leaves clues. We can go and look at what other people are doing and adapt it and make it better and, and apply it to our own thing. But often it's fear is the reason why people aren't making progress. And underneath that, is lots and lots of different things that have led to that fear. But I guess that's where my head goes, first of all. So let's look at this list. Let's imagine a real life scenario. As soon as you mentioned it, you've launched a YouTube channel and you've put out 10 videos and then you come to us and you go, I've tried everything. I've done 10 videos. I've only got 500 views. What would your feedback to that person be, Simon? Okay, so I look at this in two ways. One is tactical and one is emotional. So I go through the tactical questions first because that gets people talking and it helps to identify in their own minds what are the things that they haven't tried. So I would say to them, okay, so I'm going to ask you a series of questions and depending on how you answer them, that will determine where we go next. So my very first question that I'll ask people, if they say, oh, look, I'm not getting the results that I want, the first question I'm going to ask you is, have you focused on one idea or are you trying to do multiple things? Do you remember that awesome lady that came to one of our courses in central London that was running a recruitment agency, a travel company, and a beautician business off of the same homepage of a website? It was, do you remember her? Yes, I do. I remember very well. It was the Poplar event, and she was actually a recruitment agency, and then it was care packages or baskets for Hindus and stag do's. That was it. What's the American translation for Hindu and stag do's? Bachelorette parties and bachelor parties. She had the same website. Like, if you need a job, click on the left. If you need a box full of plasticky things for your bachelorette party, click on the right. 
and then wondered why people got confused or didn't want anything to do with it. So this thing about focus, and we've chatted about this on a couple of episodes as well. The thing about focus is the first question. Have you focused on one idea? Is your YouTube channel, to carry on with your example, you know, is it themed? Is it along a similar theme or is it completely different stuff? Because if you're not entirely clear what you're doing, then nobody else is going to be. And then linked to that question number two is, have you focused on your target audience? And I think there are some businesses are very, very easy to figure out the target audience because the product or the service or the content that they're creating is very, very niche. So the target audience kind of looks after itself to a certain extent. But have we focused the thing that you're doing on a target audience or is it too broad? And that's such a common thing that we see is that, you know, if you say to people, who's your target customer? The most common answer we'll get is, well, everybody. everybody, Or anybody that likes to watch my videos. And I say, well, okay, what about a seven-year-old in Glasgow? Are they interested in your channel? And again, uh, not really, no, because I'm, I'm doing flower arranging in Bristol. So, okay, well, it's probably people that want to buy flowers in Bristol. That's the starting point. Then let's have a look at that. Because then, you know, you can be much more laser-like with your promotion. And we get a little bit confused with promoting our business sometimes because, you, you know, we think, oh, I've got to go and tell everybody about everything. No, you don't. You just need to find a small number of people who are most likely to watch your videos or most likely to buy your product. Lots of people could, but let's just be focused on, you know, what age are they? Where are they? What other stuff are they interested in? And let's be super, super laser-like focused on the niche audience. And the greatest resource for this that I've read is Kevin Kelly's A Thousand True Fans. And that just it just explains that very clearly that you don't need to sell to everybody. In fact, if you've got a small number of people that love everything that you do, they're going to carry the message for you. So that's the second question. The third question that I'll ask people is, what's the size of the action you've taken to promote it? And because I know that fear is the thing that prevents most of us from taking the steps that we know deep down what we need to take, it's usually that they've done one Facebook post, got a little bit stressed and depressed that only three people engaged with it, and then didn't do another one for three weeks. This was me in 2003, I sent three sales emails over two weeks and then couldn't understand why no one replied. Now, of course, knowing what I know now, that I'm going to send 300 emails probably every day and I need to fill the funnel with, you know, the size of the action that we need to take to promote is so much higher than we think it is that you don't have the right to say my business idea hasn't worked because most of us haven't put it in front of enough people enough times to test whether it's working. You know, and, you know, don't do one Facebook post, do 100. Don't follow five people, follow 500 a week. Don't send one email, send 1,000. Don't make one phone call, make 100 phone calls because the feedback that you're going to get and the learning that you're going to go through is going to help you mold, shape, and, and figure out which direction to take the business because it probably isn't going to go in the same direction that you think it's going to whilst you're cooking it up in the safety of your own back garden. Absolutely. So the first actual thing before you even think about quitting is to do an honest audit of what you have done and how it's gone so far. So if you can go through those questions Simon's asked, which is, is it one idea? Have you focused? Do you know the target market? What action have you taken? And on an honest audit about what you have tried, then we can look at what results came from that? What has happened? And I think the thing here, this is actually a saying my wife keeps repeating to me. Actually, she says it with a swear word and shouts at me normally. If anyone who knows Katie, they will know she just shouts at me. Uh, she just says, it's not linear. It's not linear. And what she means by that is people expect, if I send one email, I'll get one response. If I send five emails, I get five responses. If I do X, I get Y back. And business, business is not linear. It's more like an exponential curve. And you throw energy out into the void. You send 50 or 100 emails a day for three months. And then all of a sudden you get a load of replies three months later. It's not linear. None of this is linear. And I think it's an absolute mistruth that you should expect to get that kind of growth that quickly. It comes later. But I guess the question is, how much action have you taken and how much response have you got? And 
when to know on that graph whether it's going to grow or not. And I think one last example, Simon, before I ask you your thoughts on this. I always remember Gary Vaynerchuk talking about Wine Library TV, his first YouTube channel, and he kind of glosses over it. He says, I launched it, I put videos out, 18 months later, I've got 149,000 followers. But then you come back to it, and actually, for the first six months, no one watched except for his grandma. That was it. He was throwing out all this content and all this energy, and no one was watching. And the growth happened later. So none of this is linear. But how do you balance that, Simon, with that thought of none of this is linear versus I've done a load of work and nothing's happened, should I quit? How do you balance those two concepts in your mind? Yeah, I'm not sure you can. I think if someone asked me to write a book of everything I've learned about selling since 2003, I think it would be about 30 pages long and there would be one word on each page and it would say persistence, chapter one. And then you turn over the page, it says chapter two, persistence. And guess what chapter three is called? Persistence and so on. You know, Some of the results that we've been getting through pop-up business school sales have come at the fourth, fifth and sixth follow-up. And most people don't follow up. And that persistence has really helped us to grow our business. And I think you can kind of times that by five if you're thinking about what's happening online. Because just because you've done one post online or you've made one comment, actually people need to see you 15 to 20 times on average, according to some of the studies on this stuff, before they're even interested enough and curious enough to click on your face you know, to check out the website, to check out your page and so on. There's a couple more questions that I go through as part of the diagnostic process before I start sort of diving into people's brains and pulling out what you're scared of and all that sort of stuff. And, and Sean McHugh is brilliant at this too. It's this thing of, okay, so have you focused on one idea? Have you got your niche? Have you taken the size of the action that you need to take? And then I guess the next bit of it is, is how good is the execution? Because I've seen some people with some brilliant ideas. I've seen some stuff of people that are doing education through Instagram, for example. You know, some of the folk that have been through pop up, some of the folk that are doing this are executing really, really well. Their posts are engaging, they're fun, they look fresh, they look interesting. But some of them are just a bit boring. And first rule of marketing and all that, don't be boring. And how we execute our promotion is the next bit. If I want to get some really good results with something, I want to look at who is already getting some really good results at this stuff and what can I learn from them? I don't need to copy them because they're doing it their way. I want to do it my way, which will always be different. But what can I learn from what people are already doing? And am I taking the trouble, linked to my point earlier on, am I taking the trouble to educate myself however I do that? you know, in order to feed that into my process. And I think, you know, one of the things that we learned through pop-up, you know, back in 2015, when we had a, an empty calendar of events, you and I threw everything in the kitchen sink at it for three or four months and nothing really happened. And then there was a tidal wave of business that happened later. So it's recognizing that a little bit like Seth Godin's stuff around the dip, that there's going to be a period of time where you're not going to get the results that you want. And that's okay because that's part of the process. It's not what we linear. Need to it's yeah, not linear. Need, it's not. Let's get Katie on this podcast. I just want to hear her say that bit and keep playing it in my ears every time I don't get the results that I want. But you do have to invest your time and energy up front. You have to put it in up front. And especially with the, you know, the YouTube model, just to go back to your original example, that's definitely not linear. We've seen that ourselves. You know, We did a video a day as an experiment for three or four months, about three years ago, I think it was now, Alan, and then nothing really happened. And the guy that we hired to do that, Jack, bless him, was getting a little bit hot under the collar thinking, I'm doing all this work, but we're not seeming to get the results that we want. And it wasn't until towards the end of that video a day experiment, that's when we started to see a, a higher lift in the number of subscribers and the number of views that were happening on a sort of weekly basis. But the first two or three months, nothing happened. No one watched them except us. And actually, we quit at that point, Simon. We stopped doing regular content on YouTube. Paused. Yeah, like it might come back in the future, but yeah, we quit. Yeah, back now. We're doing it now. Is it? But you're absolutely right. That's partly a commercial decision to go, what is the main focus? What is the engine that's driving our business at this moment in time? When you're low on resources, there's lots of things that you could do, but what's the thing that's going to add the most value now? 
and what am I excited about doing the most? And it's that, a sort of a combination of those things. And I think, you know, we found it relentless at the time. And I think we decided to put our efforts and energies in other parts of the business. But I think over the last couple of years, I've been sort of thinking, we've really got to get that stuff rolling again. And in this, that challenge, you know, there's always competing priorities, but there is always time. Time is one thing that we do have, but we do have to be deliberate and make the time to do the stuff that we think is important. And I think it's the focus time, because we at that time were making phone calls, running events, doing YouTube videos, trying to do, we were doing so much. And I've definitely found if you do a little bit of everything, you do nothing particularly well. So if our listeners are running a mini experiment, it's have you properly focused? Have you gone all in? Have you given it energy? Just for two weeks or whatever it is, or maybe it's two months, I've gone all in, I've thrown everything at it to see if we can get any green shoots. And I just, that analogy of green shoots for me, I think is really useful for this. So imagine you planted a seed and you've planted this plant and you've started watering it and nothing happens. And you water it the next day and nothing happens. Now you've been watering it for three weeks and there's nothing. And you start to think, why am I bothering? And then all of a sudden, this tiny little green shoot pokes out of the soil. And actually what's been happening underneath is the roots have been growing ever since, but you haven't seen it until it poked out. And what I always look for with these experiments is I'm watering it, watering it, watering it, watering it. Are there any green shoots to keep me excited to go further? The challenge you've got is if you dig up that seed to check to see if it's putting down roots, you'll kill it. What you need to do is keep going with faith for a certain period and then see if they're green shoots. But how do you know where these green shoots are, Simon, and how do you see them? It's a nice question. and I love this analogy. I absolutely love this analogy because it's so true that you keep watering and nothing really happens. And some plants grow quicker than others, of course. And it was fun. We planted a sunflower recently with my little one. And the growing cycle of the sunflower is actually quite satisfying in the first few days that, you know, he planted it. He got bored because nothing really happened for a couple of days. I kept watering it when he wasn't looking. And then, of course, hey, presto, a week later, you've got a, a plant that's you know a couple of inches high. I think you've got to recognize some things are a slower burn than others. You know, some plants take longer to grow than others and recognizing that, OK, if I want to create a YouTube channel and my goal is to hit 100,000 subscribers, you've got to recognize that, you know, we're in it for a three or four year thing here. But actually, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I could do. If I'm smart, I could accelerate that time frame based on what excites me the most. And I think we do need to invest some of our time in understanding where our motivation comes from to do this stuff. Because if you leave your motivation to chance, then you're not going to get the results that you want. You know, some days you wake up and you're just not feeling it. We all have those days, but planning for those days and knowing what do I need to remind myself of on the days when I'm not really feeling it, and recognizing I need to look after myself too. But for example, the reason why, you know, what's the reason why you're doing this? Often people feel like quitting. It's because they've disconnected with their reason why. So if you're looking at the next few months of activity that you're going to do and keep on watering the plant, and sort of balancing, like just to go back to your question, how do you balance that stuff in your mind? If I put this effort in and I'm not going to see any results, I think we've got to measure the activity and not measure the results in the early days. That's what I experienced with doing sales in the early days. I didn't consider myself to be a natural salesman. I found it really tough to send emails and make phone calls and not feeling like I was getting any feedback you know, from people because I didn't understand that I had to follow up a few times and I didn't understand that it was going to take a few weeks to have the conversation. I just didn't get that stuff. So what I started to do was to measure the activity. This was, you sent me James Clear's blog. I remember it. You sent me the blog post about putting paper clips in the cup. Yes. Um, and that measuring the activity helps you balance it in your mind, but on a bigger level and, and just sort of state, you know, what's the stuff that makes me fired up? The stuff that makes me fired up is to remind myself of why I'm doing this. 
why is it that I'm doing this business? Why is it that I want to make my YouTube channel? Why is it that I want to do this thing? Well, what's it for? Is it because you want freedom? Do you want to get rid of the job that you hate doing? Do you want to you know, look after your own destiny? Do you want to teach your kids? Do you want to create intergenerational wealth? Do you want to be affluent? Do you, are you fed up with someone else calling the shots? Whatever your reason why is, why are you doing it? And why do you love this topic, this project, this business idea so much? Just keep spending a little bit of time every day reminding yourself of that. That means that you're inoculating yourself against this sort of feeling of inaction and just that meh kind of feeling, you know, when you're not feeling it. Don't leave your motivation to chance. Be deliberate about what fires you up. That helps you balance the effort that you put in to the results that you're going to get and how long it's going to take to get them. But I do think having that, I'm going to make 100 emails a day, or actually I'm going to send 50 emails a day. I'm going to do this for two weeks and then I'm going to have a check-in and see how far have I got? Have I made any sales? Have I got any leads? Is anyone actually interested? That idea of actually I'm going to measure the activity and then I will only check progress at the end to decide are there any green shoots or not? And if I can see some green shoots, I might press in. If I can't, then I might go, actually, now's the time to quit. Because Quitting can be an excellent thing. This is the real bit. Saying no to things and quitting actually allows space for other projects in your life. If you hold on to things, there's no space in your life. So your frame on quitting, Simon, is quitting a good thing? What do you think about it? I am the king of having a gazillion ideas and a whole bunch of unfinished projects. So when people come along to Pop-Up Business School, and you know they talk about their business ideas and they say, I don't want to let any of these go because they're all good ideas. I smile at them knowingly because I've been there and I'm still there. You still to, are there. <laughs> I have to train myself to recognize what's going on because I love new ideas. I love working on new stuff. That's what fires me up. If there's one thing that will get me pumped, I did it to you on Saturday morning. I spent three hours working on Saturday morning. I saved my Saturday mornings for ideas time. And I was so excited that I'm going to interrupt Alan Saturday and I'm going to call him about this thing because I'm pumped. And I get really excited about new ideas. But I think the revelation for me, it was a Tim Ferriss episode. I think maybe it was in one of his books. It was uh, the frame to use to prevent yourself from going down rabbit holes of unfinished projects or things that take your energy away from what's really important to you deep down and what, what hits your values. And you know what I'm going to say, Alan? It was the hell yeah or no way. Yes, I think that was Ryan Holiday on the Tim Ferriss show. Okay, nice. A good memory. So I think that was the bit for me that just kind of, if you put that as a frame on when to quit, looking at all of these things that you've got rolling around you, is this business idea lighting you up? Would it light you up if it was to work? Is this a hell yeah? Or is this a bit of a meh? If it's a meh, there is no middle ground. It's a no way. And that that can help you make some some tough decisions, but create the time and space to focus on the stuff that's really important. So let's talk about sunk cost fallacy for a second here, because there's a reason why people don't quit. And sometimes the reason is, I've spent six months working on this business, or I've spent three years thinking about this idea. I can't quit now because of all the work I've done. And sunk cost means the cost of time, energy, and money that you have sunk into the project already. and that sometimes stops people from actually moving on and moving forwards. And the sunk cost fallacy is sometimes that's a money hole that you can keep pouring money, time and energy into ad finitum and it'll never go. And one of the examples, Simon, do you remember the guy who came to us in, uh, I think it was Ramsgate, who was building the dating website and he wouldn't tell us about it for about three, four, five days. And eventually we find out that the key differentiator between his dating website and every other one is that the females who sign up to the dating website will get a watch for signing up to the dating website. And he'd sunk £60,000, so probably like $90,000, into building the website. And he was sold that this was going to be the idea, and he kept on going he had no customers. No one was signed up to the dating website. It wasn't working. 
but he'd sunk so much into it that he felt like he had to keep going. Do you remember this guy, Simon? I do remember him. Yeah, I'm shifting uncomfortably in my seat because I remember the conversation. He was absolutely adamant that the thing was going to work. And yeah, and I, I go back to the diagnostic and I go, have you focused on one thing? Well, yeah, you have. Have you focused on your target audience? Mm, not really. What's the size of the action you've taken to promote it? None. 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 And there we go. That, that was his challenge. And I think if he had have done that, he could have saved himself about £59,500 because the, the way that he'd executed was not going to work. If you put it in front of 10,000 of your target customers and no one signs up, that gives you a clue that something needs to change in the way that you've executed. Well, he'd actually broken the golden rule that we all live by, which is sell your value before you create it. He'd actually created the value before he sold it, hence why he sunk so much money into doing it. If you want more on that, that's episode 10 with Katie Coombs and Sean McHugh, all talking about how to sell first before you actually create. But this guy had sunk so much money into it, he didn't want to quit. And I didn't want to kill his dream, but I wanted to tell him, stop spending money on this. You are wasting your money. You're putting yourself in debt. So how do you know if you've sunk money, time, energy into this thing? How do you know when's time to cut loose, Simon? For me, it's a I think it's the excitement factor. You know, are you having fun doing this? Because there's some people that out there that, you know, take music as an example. You know what I'm like, I'm passionate about music. I'll mess around with different instruments and recording. I know I'm always going to do that. And I will spend hours and hours doing it. And there's a fab quote or a meme or something going around somewhere that only a musician would load $25,000 worth or pounds worth of equipment into the back of a car or a van that's worth $400 and drive it around the country, drive for 300 miles to play a gig to three people that you don't get paid any money for. You know, there's always things out there that people do because they're so passionate about it. They're going to sink money into it and so on, but we do it because we love it. And you know, the word passion is, is the Latin. I think it's Latin, isn't it? A uh, passio, which means to suffer. I'm pretty sure I've read that somewhere and it's true. It's our sufferance. I think if you stopped having fun, that is a clue to stop doing what you're doing because it's time to go and do something else. Why on earth would you do it if you're not enjoying it? Then just quit. Quit as quickly as possible and move on to something else because actually I think there is a magic in quitting because if you've fully gone for it, if you've thrown your energy into it and you go, actually, this didn't work, I quit, and you start something new, you've got a chance of that new thing being successful. What most people do is they don't quit and they hold on to the one idea for three, five, ten years. In that period, I would have tried 25 ideas. And I'll tell you what, one of them would have been hugely successful. The rest I would have quit or put on the someday maybe list or come back to. So I think it's about the speed, the speed with which you test an idea all in and then move on to the next one if it doesn't go where you want to do. And the big bit here is about being honest with yourself, because I think we can all get seduced by the idea. We can all get seduced by the fact that we came up with the idea and it's so, so cool because it's my idea. But you can forget that actually no one else in the world thinks it's a good idea. And you can ignore that and keep pressing on. And there's a real danger there that you get seduced with your own idea. And this reminds me of, do you remember Newport One, the first pop-up business school we ran in Newport? Uh, There was a gentleman with a new type of bike lock. Do you remember that, Simon? <laughs> I, do, I do remember this guy very clearly, Alan. <laughs> and I wanted to help him. I so wanted to help him. He came in, he had a plastic beaker, a plastic cup with a big chain attached to it and a standard padlock. And you could put the beaker on your bike where you would normally put a D-lock and then you just pulled the chain out, looped it round and clipped the padlock on. And that was his invention. He spent so much time convincing me it was amazing. And I looked at it. And the thing I always say to people, Simon, is I can't tell you whether this will be successful. I can tell you whether I would buy it. And he said, OK, Alan, will you buy it? And I said, no, because I just thought people have already fixed this. A D-lock is actually quite good for a bike. It's way stronger than a standard padlock. And there's way better solutions. And I said, no. And he said, oh but I think it's an amazing idea and everyone tells me it's amazing. And I said, well, go out there and try and sell it. And I was trying to get him to go and stand outside the bike shop 
and speak to cyclists and ask them if they would buy it and get real feedback. But he wouldn't do it. All he wanted was to find out where he could get the money to manufacture 10,000 to then go and sell afterwards. And I just really struggled with that. He wouldn't take the steps to go and test the idea properly. He wouldn't do it. What would you have done, Simon? Like, what would you have done in his situation? Uh, I don't know. I was at a loss with this guy because you just couldn't get through to him. I do remember him being a little bit aggressive with you as well, which I couldn't decide if this was bad news or hilarious. I think it was a bit of both. (laughs) We definitely had our moments because he would not accept the fact that he had to go out and sell. All he wanted to do was find out where he could raise money. And he would not, he would not go and sell it to cyclists. I think that was a great example of someone that gets seduced by the idea of something, but either it doesn't excite them or it feels like a stretch too far, or maybe even a blind spot of what does it actually take to design and manufacture a product from scratch and get it on the shelves in, you know, in bike stores across the country. It was, it's a myth. You know, he was kind of thinking that some angel investor was going to fly down, certainly not with his aggression, but to fly down and give him a chunk of cash to go and make the thing. And I think you were giving him an opportunity to go and test the idea and experiment with the idea. You know, if I made this for you, would you like one? And I'll make it for you for five pounds. Yeah, I've got three here. Buy it now. Would you spend 10 pounds on it, 15 bucks on it? Buy it now. That's what I wanted him to do was actually go and ask customers to buy. That's the real experiment to know whether you should quit or not. If you've approached 300 cyclists and asked, would you buy it? And everyone said no and told you why. That's feedback. That's real feedback to move on. Yeah, I think he'll take that um, beaker at lock and chain idea to the grave with him, Alan. I've got a feeling. So have I. And I so wanted to help him, Simon. I so wanted to help him. So look, we've been sort of mulling around this subject of quitting. I think there's real magic and power in testing an idea full out. And if it doesn't work, quitting early and trying the next one. If you're training someone in this, Simon, how do you lay that out for them? How do you define it? I guess it it depends on what they want to do and why they're doing it and so on. But I think you don't really know what results you're going to get until you put it in front of someone and ask them for cash. So I love this idea of going all in. But I think all in means different things to different people. I just think it just means you've got to commit. And because it's a mini experiment, you know, like we talked to it in that episode, you only need to sort of commit three, four, five weeks to it in the first instance, maybe even a couple of weeks. And just to pause, reflect on what you've learned and ask yourself some good questions. Did I enjoy that? How does it feel if I was to spend the next four weeks doing that? How could I make this more successful? How could I accelerate it? How could I put it in front of more people? You know, but it doesn't matter where you focus, but it does matter that you focus just to start. And that's just my view. You know, and I think this comes from me. I've got the curse of the creative. Many of us have. I get a business idea about every 15 minutes. I get pumped. I go, oh, that's the one. That's the new one. And I write it down and then I go back to the thing that I've said is my business. And I focus on that for a bit longer. And then maybe I'll revisit that in a few weeks time. But I think, you know, managing the ideas and managing our own energy is part of this for me. How many times have I said we just need to focus on pop-up? And how many times have I come to you and said we shouldn't focus on pop-up? Here's a load of new ideas. <laughs> Those are the fun days. You can see the members of the team. What do you mean we're going to close pop what, what, what do you mean we're going to close the doors? Yeah, we're just going to just to explore it for a second and see if there's something new. And yeah. we've always come back to it to go, no, no, this is the thing that we need to push. And I think there is this sense for me about I think the mistake that I've made in the past is to run with lots of different ideas. And I think I'm just starting to realize right now the power of diving into one idea. And this comes with some, you know, there needs to be a chunk of self-awareness here to understand what really makes us tick as individuals. But I'll give you a very direct example of this. So over the years, as you know, I've been running a whole bunch of creative sessions with senior leaders in big brands before you know, doing the pop-up stuff with you. And I had this expression, this phrase that I always used to say that when people are having a long conversation and it goes on a bit, there's an interesting one, it goes on a bit. I used to close the conversation off and go, well, thanks everybody. That was a really good talky bit. Let's move on to the next thing. And, and this became my sort of unofficial catchphrase for a while. And I've used it, you know, since we've been in pop-up, I use it a lot too. And I thought to myself, wouldn't it be cool to have a chat show 
So maybe it's a podcast thing and I'm going to call it the really good talky bit. And I got loads of energy for it. And I made an Instagram and then I, you know, I started lining up guests. I started emailing people, but I didn't push that idea over the line because I paused and I went, you know what? I need to lean in to the one idea that's my best guess of what excites me the most right now. And that is to light a fire under the pop-up business school and grow this thing. So I've had lots of ideas like that around the fringes of pop-up. But I'm leaning into pop-up and look what's happened. We're running live streams that would probably turn into a podcast event twice a week at the moment. And, you know, what am I doing? I'm hosting a chat show. I'm interviewing people. I'm doing exactly the thing that I said I wanted to do. But it's not come about by having lots of different ideas and trying little bits of them to happen. It's come about because I've leaned into one idea and then that is leading on to other things but there's a nucleus of an idea in here, which is about going out of our way to help as many people as we can get their business ideas tested and grown. And it's interesting for me that by parking and like you were saying about quitting, making a decision to cut, I'm going to cut that off. I'm going to cut that out and I'm going to not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to lean into this as my main idea and make this happen. These ideas are starting to come in anyway. So I'm kind of getting my kicks from those original ideas as they start to emerge that are linked to the core thing. So if you lean into one idea and go, you know what, I know this about myself. This is the thing that excites me the most. There are so many different ways of applying yourself and running with that idea. You could have the podcast, the YouTube channel, the radio show, the chat show, the the merchandise, you know, the training courses, the online courses, the live streams. All of this comes off of that main idea that you have, but you've got to lean into it first to make it happen. I absolutely agree. It's about the focus. And I think we've had so many conversations about that focus and we all get seduced by new ideas and new things, but it is the focus. We all like a bit of seduction, Alan. Oh, definitely. Next segment, pivoting versus quitting. What's the difference? Pivoting versus quitting. And when do you know which one to do? I guess the definition of pivoting is probably a good first point as well. Pivoting means this I didn't quite work. I'm going to change direction and try something similar, but not quite the same. I'm pivoting. Quitting means I'm just saying no, I'm going to do something completely different. That would be for me the difference. But when do you know which one to do, Simon? I have no idea, Alan. I I saw this come up and I thought, I'm looking forward to this bit because I'm going to learn something from you. (laughs) I don't know. You should be asking the questions then, I think. Yeah. I think the thing that went through my head was, I don't know why I use a sailing analogy because I'm not that crazy about boats. I mean, I love the idea of sailing, but they make me sick. So, you know, if you're going to set sail for somewhere, you don't go in a straight line. You've got to adjust the sail for the wind and you kind of tack your way and you might go to the left for a bit. You you can tell I'm not a sailor. Then you go to the right for a bit. I think they've got specific names for that. And then you sort of tack your way and then you eventually reach the destination. But the route that you take to get there tends to be completely different from the one that you might have had in your head. And the market conditions that we're in, for example, that might mean that you need to adjust your course and go in a different direction for a while just because, oh, hang on a minute, we can't do live events right now. We need to pivot our business and go online. Like We're still delivering our mission. We're still creating the stuff that we wanted to create, but we've figured out a different way of delivering it based on the winds change, a different direction, or there's some other external force that's taken us off course, whether it's the current, whether it's the wind, or whether it's something else, something unforeseen, or maybe it's something that we plan for. I think sometimes we've got to go, actually, the weather conditions look completely stormy, or I'm fed up of getting seasick. I'm going to stay on the land, and I'm going to try something different. I'm going to park this, and then I'll set sail for the island another day. So I think that's the kind of analogy that I'm thinking about in terms of Okay, I just need to adjust the course and try something slightly different here. I need to change direction a little bit. Maybe there's a different island to head to as a result of what I've learned. But you don't know what that destination is until you lift the anchor, jump on the boat, and then start heading off somewhere. And the direction that we all head in is just our best guess of what excites us the most. If I'm excited to go there, let's start that journey, see what it feels like, you know, and is that the right thing? Is that the right direction to go in? Well, let's try it and see. And then once you're halfway down that road, then you might be thinking, you know, maybe it's not that, maybe it's not what I thought it was, but I never would have known that if I hadn't have started that process. 
now I've got to think, okay, so based on what I've learned, what's the new direction to go in? Or do I need to go back to the beginning again? And I think pivoting can be quite something as simple as, let's take an example, I'm going to do cookery courses for schools. And that's what I'm going to sell. You go out there, try and sell it. Schools say they don't want it. But you actually get a lead in a housing association or a housing authority and they say, we'll have it. And then all of a sudden you pivot and go, okay, I won't run my course for them. I'll run it for them. And quite often the pivot can be in the market. It can be in the way you deliver it online versus offline. You're changing something within it, but you're not killing off the whole idea. You're trying it in a different bit. And I think it's staying open to what the universe gives you and the feedback that comes back when you put yourself out there. Because if you go out there and put yourself out there massively, you will get feedback. The world, the universe will tell you stuff. And it's listening to that and being open to pivoting based on that feedback. And if you can pivot then, that's a great thing. If you put the idea out there and there's crickets in the universe and no one wants it and actually you get negative feedback, that's probably the time to quit and try something else. And that for me, I think, is the difference is people say, oh, it's a good idea. It's not just for me. Well, then pivot and try it in a different way or do it for a different person. If they go, no, thank you. And you go, why? And they go, I don't think that'll ever succeed. And people tell you that repeatedly. Maybe that's the point to quit. And that for me is the difference. You might pivot the style, the type, the customer, the way. But if you get nothing back from the universe, if you put a lot of energy out there and you've got nothing back, that's absolutely the time to quit. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I, I guess just as you were saying about negative feedback, then it just reminded me of what happens to Alan when Alan gets negative feedback. And you do react differently to that. And I do too, in the sense that if I get negative feedback from someone, I need to figure out how much weight am I going to give this? There's plenty of people queuing up out there to give negative feedback about something. In fact, we've had it for pop up. People have gone, well, you know, they thought we were mad for teaching people to start a business without a business plan. And now look what happens. You can start a business in 20 minutes. You don't need a plan. You just need to go out and sell something. And then you'll figure out, is this a business that I want to start or not? You know, they thought we were crazy for that. We, we've got and still do get negative feedback about that, but that doesn't stop us. And I guess it's understanding that there will be people that will throw rocks at your idea. You know, out of those people, what's their motivation for chucking rocks at your idea? And are they a potential customer? If they're a potential customer, I might give it a bit more credence. But also, you don't have to appeal to everybody. Like many of us can run a successful business with a small number of customers. And that might be enough. You don't necessarily have to. People might hate your videos, but I bet there'll be a bunch of people that will like them. And it's just about, like you say, the size of the action that you take and compare that with the amount of negative feedback that you're getting. If you've taken massive action and you know your best guess of what you've learned is that you've done a reasonable job of it, but you're still not getting those results, maybe that's the time to go, actually, maybe it's time to, to pull back. So we'd love to know, Simon and I would both love to know, what ideas have you tested and why did you move on? Because actually, this is a really interesting subject and we want to develop this as a resource for entrepreneurs in the future to know I'm doing the mini experiment as in episode seven. And now I've run my mini experiment. I've had feedback. I've put it out into the world. I've gone full in for two weeks or a month. I've emailed lots of people and I've decided it's not worth it. Because I think that's a really important decision for you to be able to make. Simon, any closing messages for our audience? I guess the, the, one of the things to help me get unstuck was removing the fog. You know, we've all got lots of fog in our brains. We've got lots of open loops of challenging circumstances or chemical reactions because we have a couple of bottles of wine at the weekend. And then when we've got brain fog, when we're confusing ourselves because there's lots of things in our heads, that it's actually quite difficult to see through the fog and to figure out which direction to head in. And I think what really unlocked me was removing some of that fog and eating that frog and dealing with the things that need to be dealt with and cutting back on things that were adding to the fog so that I was able to think clearly. And I bet there's a bunch of people listening to this that would be going, I'm finding it hard to make a clear decision because I'm worried about money or I'm worried about my family. I'm worried about my relationship. I'm worried about my job. You know, I think if I was to get to a place where I needed to make a decision about which direction to go in, I've got to free up my brain and just clear down some of these open loops of thoughts in my head because then I'm much more likely to make a, a clear and true decision 
that's going to best reflect the values that I've got and take me in a direction I want to go in. Thank you very much, Simon Payne. I quit. (laughs) Good luck. God bless. So thank you for listening to this episode all about quitting. A couple of things I would love your help with. The first is if you come across anyone who's thinking of starting a business, send them episode two, five ways to build a business without debt. We really want to smash the belief that it takes money to make money and inspire people that they can build a business and they can make money doing something they love. So if you know anyone who's thinking about launching a business in the early stages or already launched, send them episode two. That would really help us. The second is we'd love you to write us a review. Those things help the algorithms work and it helps us to get the podcast out to more people. So please take a moment to write a review about what you think of this podcast. That would really help us. And then coming up, Simon and I have got some great episodes for you. I'm actually really excited about the next one, which is episode 22, The Entrepreneur's Guide to Investing. And I'm going to have Simon on the show with me, along with J.L. Collins, the author of The Simple Path to Wealth. And we'll be talking about what do you do with those profits? You've started to make money. What do you do with the profits? If it comes in lumps, how do you deal with it? How do you invest it? And how do you set yourself up for a long-term safe future? And this is critical. Given the volatility in the world right now and the things that happen, this is a critical, critical episode. And then we're moving on from there. There's so much coming up for you. Thank you for tuning in to The Rebel Entrepreneur. And remember, quitting is a positive thing. The quicker you realise something isn't for you, the quicker you can get onto something that you'll actually love. There's a fine line between stubbornness and persistence, and you need to listen to the universe, take the feedback, get in tune with what you really want, and then make that decision quickly. You've been listening to Rebel Entrepreneur with Alan Donegan. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes to get new, fresh episodes as soon as they've launched. To stay up to date with the rebellion, visit choosefi.com slash rebel. Thanks for joining the rebellion.